Well, thank you, uh, Catherine, for the kind introduction. And I'd like to uh, begin by thanking all the organizers for having me here. I've so enjoyed uh, this series of webinars uh, up to date, uh, and I so look forward to uh, the others to come. And, and so uh, today, um, I'd like to take an opportunity to tell you a little bit about the, the work that has been going in my lab and a, a new story as well, as Catherine said. So firstly, just uh, my disclaimers are there. My lab receives or receive funding from those organizations, um, all of which uh, relate to an extent or another to targeted protein degradation. Um, and as Catherine said, I have interest in Amphista Therapeutics. So uh, to start, um, uh, firstly, I would like to um, really acknowledge uh, the fantastic uh, contributions uh, of many people. Uh, since I started my uh, independent career, my own group, uh, almost 11 years ago, and many people, uh, both current and, and former in my lab, um, that have contributed to um, uh, the, all the work that we're doing. And uh, I've highlighted here uh, those that um, I've contributed to some of the stories I'm going to tell you, uh, but also uh, our fantastic collaborators, um, uh, more recent, and, uh, and also the funding bodies for supporting uh, our research. And so these are really the, the heroes of the science I'm going to uh, talk to you today. And so I'm going to begin uh, by just uh, giving you an overview of what my talk is going to be today about. Uh, so I'm going to uh, start by uh, uh, telling you uh, about uh, our evolving learnings about how uh, degraders work, and in particular, uh, how, why the ternary complex matter and, and how this understanding is now illuminating important principles uh, that is guiding the, the way we think about and, and we actually design and, and, and develop degraders. And so that work is, is all mainly published. And then in the second part of my talk, uh, I'm very excited to share with you uh, an unpublished yet story, but we just got it preprint out today um, on sort of taking degraders beyond bifunctionals uh, uh, to what we call trivalent protax. And uh, uh, very excited uh, to hear feedback from the community on this. So let me begin with a little primer uh, on, on protax. Uh, you've heard. Uh, already uh, from the uh, fantastic speakers in, in this uh, seminar series, uh, Frey and Craig and, uh, and, and others, uh, what protax are, uh, bifunctional degraders by definition, so with two heads, uh, one uh, a ligand for a, a target uh, protein, joined by a linker to a ligand to any three ubiquitin ligase, uh, and so these ubiquitin ligases, calling ring ligases are multi-subunit ligases. Really excited uh, to see one of the speakers coming up next, uh, Brenda Schulman, who's you know, made some tremendous uh, discoveries in this area but has really inspired a lot of our structural and biochemistry uh, work here. And, uh, and you know, as we induce to proximity, then we really hijack or co-opt, uh, whatever your favorite word, the, this natural system for then inducing ubiquitination uh, of the target protein. As a result of that, then the target protein, ubiquitinated target protein is recognized by the proteasome, the ubiquitin uh, chains get cleaved and, and, and the protein gets degraded. And so as the protein gets degraded, but the small molecule in principle is not, then we can, we can have this, uh, uh, this degrader activity uh, that has this very powerful ability to potentially in a catalytic substoichiometric manner you know, de deplete proteins. And so some of the advantages uh, of these approaches, such as depleting the target, which really phenocopies genetics much more closely than with an inhibitor. And literally the fact that we now have a molecule that uh, uh, is a proximity inducer. So we don't need a functional uh, inhibitor or ligand for our targets. Uh, we only need binding. All of these are kind of advantages that in the field we had uh, anticipated. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, with the recent uh, developments have, um, have also um, uh, demonstrated extensively. And, you know, I think, I, I guess I would like to point out though here that, you know, these this graphs are, I guess, uh, low resolutions are best, um, uh, you know, if anything misleading about how these molecules sort of work. And, but, you know, really in the field, we, we sort of thought that uh, proximity mattered as far as, you know, we could bring this target protein to reasonable proximity. We probably didn't want to bring them too close, otherwise they would clash. And so, you know, the linker shouldn't be too, too, too small, but, you know, maybe not too long, otherwise the, you know, the protein uh, could not maybe be ubiquitinated. 
And so, you know, we envisage this molecule as dumbbell, really, but obviously, you know, the linker is not rigid. The linker twists and turns, and so does the molecule. And so I guess what we really learned over the past few years is this, um, uh, the fact that these molecules uh, are inducers of protein-protein interactions. As we now bring this protein in proximity to the ligase, we form these, these new complexes. And so there's, there's a lot of nuances beyond just proximity. And that really matters. And it's important because it allows to gain extra target specificity. It can boost weak binary binding affinities. Uh, and so the way that these molecules uh, recruit these proteins together really matters. And so uh, in my talk today, I, I want to sort of take you through some of these lessons. And so to get started, uh, uh, you know, it all started for us uh, with this molecule called MZ1. And so I'd like to introduce you to these targets, the bromo and extra terminal domain, the bad proteins, uh, targets that need a little introduction to this audience um, with the molecule, this bad ligand reported here, you know, beautifully uh, discovered and reported by Jay Bradner's lab and GSK around 2010. Uh, and uh, so, you know, we developed this VHL ligand in collaboration with Craig. And so at the time, uh, we were working on these bad proteins. We developed this bump and hole approach that I'm not going to talk to you today about. We were interested in selectivity uh, for these highly conserved bad bromo domains. And so we thought, why not link these two together and see what happens? So we lever leveraged these crystal structures uh, that we and others had sold. And, uh, and we were absolutely stunned by the remarkable activity of this compound, where a simple PEG-free linker gave us very active degraders that, you know, we went on to show that worked as, as expected, uh, took down the protein in, uh, both at the endogenous level and in this uh, a transient overexpressed GFP fused, and really took away this protein really quickly, highly selectively, so we can uh, revert the stoichiometry, the, sto uh, uh, the stereochemistry at the VHL ligand to now uh, uh, lead, uh, abrogate binding to VHL and the compound no longer degrades it and can take down the protein uh, to completion very quickly. Uh, today, you know, our best degraders take away proteins in just a matter of uh, uh, tens of, uh, of minutes sometimes, uh, half an hour as well. And so the degradation uh, of, of this bad protein meant that we now had a, a much more impactful way uh, uh, on the biology uh, compared to just inhibiting the bad protein uh, as we could demonstrate um, in these leukemia cell lines uh, uh, as a result of a down-regulating MIC level, which is a downstream transcriptional uh, uh, um, uh, product of, of this activity of the bad protein, as well as in vivo. And, you know, we're really surprised uh, to see this, you know, MZ1 is uh, not at all optimized uh, uh, for in vivo activity. Uh, it's kind of like a chemical probe compound. And yet, uh, this is that in collaboration with Francesco Bertoni that we published recently, we, we could see uh, even with this uh, unoptimized compound, really powerful activity. And, you know, we and others have uh, demonstrated this uh, now over and over again in the field. But what I'd like to just highlight is this uh, perhaps much, much more unexpected and surprising finding that we saw early on when we were doing this uh, very careful dose uh, response uh, degradation uh, curves in this degradation assay. We saw this window of preferential degradation for one of these bad protein, namely BRD4, um, which uh, uh, we weren't expecting because the ligand engages these free bad proteins uh, with equal binding affinity. And so this was really a key observation for us and one that really inspired a lot of the following study I'm going to tell to you about, uh, because for the first time we really saw this feature that Prozac may confer selectivity over and above uh, that uh, of binary binding engagement to the target at the level of degradation. Uh, that is a, a feature now widely observed in the field uh, 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 for of many other targets as well, which is really a powerful uh, advantage of these degraded molecules. And so we wanted to understand a bit more about this. And so that motivated our effort in characterizing more and more of this, uh, these systems. And we were really fortunate to crystallize uh, for the first time uh, a protac bound to its ligase and target protein. And so you can see here MZ1 uh, bound snugly and, and really sandwiched between DHL and BRD4 and notably inducing key uh, uh, tight interactions between, between these two proteins. These are proteins that don't normally interact. Uh, and yet in the presence of the protac, we saw 
um, a very tight uh, packing or hydrophobic interaction, sort of hot spot in the middle of his pocket. And at the periphery of his bowel shape interface, we saw a lot of hydrogen bond uh, specific interactions and soul bridges, um, uh, some of which mimicked the native interaction of these of these proteins. And the result of this was striking. Uh, we're now burying extensive surface area, uh, but most importantly, we're now engaging residues that wouldn't normally uh, uh, be expected to contribute to, uh, to to the engagement of the inhibitors, and are much less conserved uh, uh, for these different bed bromo domains. And so. Uh, we therefore hypothesize this would actually play a role in the selectivity and in the ternary complex formation. So we went down to the drawing board and, you know, this is a complex equilibrium. We're forming a two-step process, a free body equilibrium, uh, as this protac is able to engage the two target individually before it brings together them into a ternary complex. So we can define this cooperativity alpha, uh, which when positive means that we form the ternary complex more stable than the binary complex. And ultimately, this stability of these complexes uh, uh, can, in the first instance, be defined, you know, as a delta H in the pro the delta G, total delta G in the process. And the take-home message here is that MZ1 was forming complexes of very different flavor uh, uh, for the different bat proteins. You can see here in this fluorescence polarization displacement assay uh, that these are all positively cooperative, but to very different degrees. Uh, with uh, the BID4 BD2 domain, the one we crystallize, forming the most cooperative complex at the lowest concentration, and so forming the most stable complex, which we then went on to show uh, was contributed by the protein protein interactions as uh, anticipated by the structure and consistent with the structure. And, and so, so far, uh, this pointed to very different thermodynamic properties of this complexes. But, you know, what about kinetics? After all, these degraders uh, bring about a kinetic process uh, uh, that ultimately results in ubiquitination and degradation. So surely the kinetics of the formation and dissociation of these complexes must play an important role. So we went on to develop SPR assays uh, to probe this. And in a nutshell, and this is great work by Michael Roy in the lab, uh, who's now uh, uh, back at uh, uh, the uh, uh, Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, um, so he saw that even for the BD2s, the ones that form the most cooperative complexes, uh, we saw striking differences whereby just a single residue at the interface uh, contributes remarkably to this difference, particularly in the dissociation rates. And why is that important? If we then now do a very uh, careful dose response because at the very early time point, we saw a correlation between the uh, half-life, dissociative half-life in SPR and the initial rate of degradation for these bad proteins. Uh, which really uh, went uh, a long way to begin to explain this uh, uh, remarkable selectivity for BID4 uh, with MZ1. And so just to summarize what I've just told you, uh, uh, the study of MZ1 uh, uh, elucidated how it can form very different complexes and the most cooperative, most stable, and most long-lived complexes with the protein that it most preferentially and selectively degrades, leading to faster, more profound degradation of this uh, exquisitely and remarkable degrader molecule. And so now that we, we can show that we can form these complexes that can be stable, then uh, the hypothesis would be that we can actually afford weaker binding affinities at either end. And so we were able to show this at the target end, uh, in a sort of first layer of structure-based drug design, this uh, novel uh, linkage that was inspired by the crystal structure uh, led to this remarkably selective uh, AT1 molecule, whereby we're compensating the loss of binary binding uh, 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 so, um, uh, with, uh, with uh, an exquisitely active and selective degrader. But also at the EFRI ligase end, uh, we're here by replacing uh, these uh, central hydroxyproline moiety with this uh, fluorohydroxyproline, a uh, really great chemistry from Andrea Testa, who now leads chemistry at Amphista Therapeutics, uh, we could see that despite the loss of uh, over 20-fold in binary binding to the HL, our degrader uh, could still degrade BRD4 selectively at concentrations significantly lower uh, than the target engagement KDs, again, underscoring the remarkable catalytic activity of these degraders. And so others have also shown uh, uh, many of these features now for many of our targets. Uh, but really, this, this sort of has opened up now an opportunity to kind of rethink, you know, how do we go about de designing these degraders? And we and many others in the early days, you know, we would do this kind of empirical approach 
we would scout for different exit vectors and, and link horology and, and ligand modifications in a plug and play fashion. Uh, and then went straight into degradation assays to, in the hope of finding degraders and then do MedCan driven optimizations. And, you know, we and others can do projects like this and it can work uh, with a lot of chemistry. Uh, and, you know, that empirical step is certainly something that needs to happen uh, to begin with. Uh, but now that we understand a bit more uh, about how the ternary complex plays an important role, you know, we're now really set up to, to put together assays and characterize in detail, and not just the degradation, but you know the target engagement, binary affinities, ternary affinities, cooperativity, stabilities of these complexes, you know, ubiquitination. And then we can take forward interesting molecules. You know, if we can solve the structure of this ternary complex, then we can take a cycle of a make, you know, design, make, and test that ultimately is, can be much more rational and in, pre, in principle then uh, lead to faster uh, better and, 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 be, and more selective degraders. And so I want to share with you some snapshots of examples where we've done this. And this is a, a sort of an academic exercise as an example where again, uh, following on from the early work with AT1 that I showed you earlier, we uh, again inspected the MZ1 ternary structure and we identified this uh, uh, provocative uh, potential and very curiously uh, saw this proximity between the VHL ligand and the JQ1 ligand, uh, uh, hypothesizing that we could now introduce a, a cyclizing linker uh, leading to a macrocyclic protac, uh, which we then went on to design, synthesize and test uh, where we saw remarkable activity comparable to MZ1 for this compound, uh, despite uh, uh, again, a, a loss of, of binary binding that we had observed. Uh, really consistent with the fact that the cyclization had done something really cool. And, and I think there's going to be a lot of potential for this type of pro approaches in the field moving forward. Um, and, uh, and then I want to uh, tell you uh, of a different story where uh, we were really going after a, an exciting new target uh, for, for cancer, this market two subunits of this uh, chromatin remodeling complex uh, of a bath um, class. And, uh, uh, and so here we uh, sold the structure of an early compound and use that structure uh, to then optimize within the structure, stabilize the complex and turn an inactive degrader or poor, very poorly active degrader into a, 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 an exquisitely potent and selective degrader. So in this slide, I'm just gonna uh, give you a bit more of the information of the journey here. Um, you know, we synthesized uh, uh, just a handful of about 10 protax leveraging this uh, very nice and fragment-like molecule for this market bromo domain, which uh, unlike in the case of BET, uh, bromo domain uh, is, uh, is not, it's not functional in its own right. Uh, and so we thought we, this could provide a foothold now uh, to, to uh, couple up uh, to a free ligase ligand. And yet, you know, the first round of, of molecules, uh, as I said, uh, we didn't really see great degraders, but we saw that despite a very weak binary affinity, uh, for one of these molecules, we, we had a cooperative protac. And so we saw the structure and you can see here the linker that we saw uh, was unhappy. We, we identified uh, uh, really the linker collapsed uh, and not in a very favorable uh, state. And so that uh, then led to the design of this more constrained uh, linker where we also introduced not just resistivity but also an ability to pi stack to this tyrosine residue on VHL. And you can see here going from red to per yellow to red uh, to green, we're optimizing all of these properties uh, at the ternary complex level, uh, enabling us to go very rapidly in just a few steps of optimization to a very potent compound, this compound that we call ACBI1. And so uh, Will Farnaby led chemistry in, in the lab and Manfred Kudel uh, led uh, biology from Beringer. This is a an exciting collaboration, uh, product an exciting collaboration with Beringer Ingelheim. And uh, here is just a slide to qualify the functional implication of having such a great degrader for this type of really hot cancer target. Now that we can degrade this protein, we now have a, a profound anti-proliferative cytotoxic activity in cancer cell lines that are vulnerable uh, to uh, these subunits of um, of a bath complex as shown in this particular example. And you can see the exquisite specificity of doing so uh, as a result of degradation of, of the protein uh, uh, as opposed to just inhibiting the bromo domain. But we also observed some really interesting features that we you know, see over and over again with some of our best degraders. 
uh, which uh, uh, in this particular case, we only saw uh, depletion of the engaged subunits in this TMT labeling proteomics experiment shown on the left. However, in collaboration with Tom and Hughes in the lab, an expert in the bath complex, we wanted to ask the question, what happens to the whole bath complex after we've depleted this subunit? And so we uh, IP the whole, the whole bath complex um, following protact treatment. And we now saw uh, complexes were depleted of additional subunits within the complex. And this is a, 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 a megadalton uh, uh, multi-protein uh, complex. Uh, and more recently, uh, crystal structures or cryam structures have been sold of this. And indeed, what we can see from these structures is Mark A4 is very intimately bound in the complex together with other subunits, and two of which as shown here uh, were the ones that we saw depleted uh, following the co-IP. So I think this is a, a really uh, cool example of thinking about impacting complex subunits that are not directly engaged by the protac as a result of uh, what we call collateral eviction uh, uh, due to destabilization. Uh, but there's another mechanism that can be envisaged for impacting subunits not directly engaged by the protac, which is you know, collateral ubiquitination or bystander ubiquitination. And this is what we saw with our homoprotacs. And these are VHL dimerizers. Um, and this is where developed by Chiara Maniaci in the lab where we could see not only the rapid and, uh, and profound degradation uh, of self-degradation of VHL, by these avid and cooperative uh, dimerizers CM11, but we also saw Colin 2 level going down, uh, which we also see in the TMT labeling proteomics, uh, which uh, we ascribe to, again, this effect of, uh, of collateral ubiquitination degradation. And so just to sum up you know, this first part, I think in the field, we, we, we like to think in buckets, you know, products, uh, bivalent, uh, and you know, the monovalent molecular glues, which we heard a lot about as well. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and so you know, these have all advantages and disadvantages, but I think this, this work is really pointing to the fact that uh, Protax uh, can work as glues too. And in fact, uh, we believe that once we have this proximity induced by this bivalent molecule, actually these induced protein-protein contacts uh, happen uh, much more regularly and, and much more broadly than we, we, we used to think. And so the consequence of that is we can now, I guess, take the best of the two worlds and combine this sort of school of thoughts and we can get greater target specificity. And I've showed you how we, that can allow to weaker binding affinities and how we can optimize now within the ternary complex impacting subunits in, in, within complexes. And so, and really unraveling some guiding principle, you know, of, of how these uh, protact molecules can, can work and how we can design them, how we can, we can make better molecules. Uh, which has a, a, an important impact, not just to make, you know, important uh, uh, and selective chemical probes uh, for study biology, but to make and turn these molecules into drugs, which is what uh, we and, uh, and all of us in the field are ultimately uh, interested in. And so uh, this is a kind of timeline and the kind of journey that I've taken you. And so this is, you know, some of these discoveries have really been, uh, from us and others, has really been a tipping point in the field. And now uh, Protax are taking us into all sorts of different directions. You know, I've showed you the concepts of homoprotax, microcyclic Protax. I'm gonna tell you in a moment about trivalent Protax, but this proximity modality is taking us way beyond the greatest too. And so this exponentially increasing field uh, is, you know, one where we, we, we keep rethinking about ways to innovate and, you know, we can't do it all on our own. And so I think engaging with the community is really important. And so uh, uh, we've, we've been very proactive in sharing our best product, making it available to the field uh, in various different ways, including, you know, sharing with our collaborators, Beringer Ingelheim, the Open Me portal, where you can actually get them for free uh, by a click of the, of the mouse. Uh, and in the lab, we've recently uh, started this open access TPD journal club. Uh, we, we, as an attempt to, you know, to, to cover the, the, the growing um, uh, and emerging literature. Uh, and so we, we're very open uh, and receptive to feedback. Uh, please let us know what you like the most and how you think we can improve this. Uh, but we've already been delighted to see uh, the, the field uh, uh, telling us how, how they've appreciated this. And you know, in terms of translation, again, um, uh, turning this into drugs require bringing the, the, the best of, of, of different organizations to it. So at Dundee, we're, we're a true believer of uh, the power of collaborations, you know, and like a cooperative products, we, we really believe that engaging with organizations such that 
uh, the whole is more than the sum of the part. And so I've showed you an example of the, the Berger Ingelheim collaboration and more recently uh, we've launched a collaboration with Almiral, uh, which has been recently announced and we're recruiting in all of this. Uh, so do reach out if you're interested in, uh, in taking part in this, in this exciting effort. And then, you know, founding startup is another uh, uh, way of translational uh, uh, this fundamental science. And I'm very fortunate to, to you know, to, to have uh, contributed to the founding of Amphisto Therapeutics uh, with Nikki Thompson and Ian Church now at the helm of uh, an exciting uh, new company in this space. And so uh, with that, I, I, I would now like to uh, move on and tell you about uh, this uh, story uh, that as, um, uh, as Catherine said, has just uh, come out as a preprint literally a few hours ago, but we're very excited about and, uh, and uh, we look forward to hearing uh, uh, you know, the field's uh, feedback and thought on, which is taking now the products beyond uh, by functionality to, to trivalent products. So you know, I've told you about monovalent degraders, bivalent, Protax, and uh, we recognize, you know, forming these stable complexes um, is, is, is a challenging uh, thing to do when we're monovalent at the target end. Uh, and so we hypothesize, uh, how about, uh, you know, increasing the valency of, of our degrader as a strategy uh, to, to stabilize further the complex and to really boost the, the mode of action. And so what I'm going to tell you today is a, is a story that has been a, a tremendously exciting and uh, and collaborative work between my lab and Daniel, then at Daniel's lab at, at Promega. And the champion of this work, uh, really Satomi Maide, who was a visiting uh, scientist from Ono Farm in my lab, and Christine Reaching in, in the net Daniel's lab. Uh, and so we chose uh, the bad proteins uh, because uh, uh, we know uh, they, they, um, uh, they're very suited for, for this kind of study, we hypothesized, because having two bromo domains within the same uh, protein and also the availability of bivalent ligands, not just the bivalent protax as benchmark, such as MZ1, but also bivalent inhibitors, we hypothesize would be extremely powerful as a model system. And so, um, so here's MZ1 again, the crystal structure. So inspection of this structure really began to uh, open an opportunity uh, to think about how we could design these molecules. And so from the NZ1 structure, we identified a uh, partially solvent exposed region on the linker uh, where we thought you know, we could branch out and, and reach out to uh, another target ligand. And then we leveraged uh, some beautiful structure and beautiful work uh, on bivalent uh, bromodomain inhibitors uh, from Tanaka et al, that's Jay Bradner's MT1, JQ1 dimerizer there. And from AstraZeneca, Mike Waring and, and others, including the net, uh, this bibet uh, dimerizer. And inspection in this case of the bivalent uh, inhibitor identified uh, a, a solvent exposed region in the MT1 molecule, but not in bibet, which we saw extremely uh, sort of fully buried at the interface. And so we went away and, uh, uh, and then uh, took forward uh, MT1 and MZ1 in, in the structural design uh, of our trivalent degraders. And, uh, and so uh, we, uh, you know, we developed trifunctional molecules. I'm, I'm gonna spare you of all the chemistry, but it's all in the chem archive now for you uh, to look into. Um, and so molecules designed by Andrea Testa, Chiara Magnacci and, and Sotomi in the lab. Uh, we made three trifunctional VHL based molecules and, and the equivalent cerebellum based molecules. And we went away and tested them. Satomi did this, and we were uh, uh, really stunned. The VHL structure guided based molecule uh, worked exquisitely well, both against the endogenous protein and uh, in these hybrid uh, um, uh, CRISPR cell lines from the net. Uh, we saw um, uh, them significantly outperforming the cerebellum base. Uh, and importantly, uh, beginning to show our performance on MZ1. It's you know, something that we've always been struggling to see uh, at such a level in the lab. And so, and this is shown in these cell viability assays in AML uh, cell line. So the, we took forward the trivalent uh, VHL based compounds. And, uh, uh, and so we identified SIM1 as uh, the most potent uh, of them all. And so in this careful dose response curve done by Christian Riching in Danette's lab, uh, you can see these, these sort of beautiful kinetic profiles. And then you can actually quantify all of this. And we could see picomolar uh, half uh, degradation concentration for SIM1 uh, for all the BET family members. Uh, and notably and curiously, uh, we, uh, we saw this preferential uh, uh, degradation of, of BRD2 
uh, which again was a target that uh, we hadn't seen previously for uh, this class of VHL uh, based degraders. Uh, so that was uh, interesting and nice to see uh, as well. And, and indeed that was confirmed in this um, um, unbiased proteomic experiment uh, where a very low concentration, 10 nanomolar and very low time point, even four hours in MB411, um, we could confer the highly selective degradation of that protein, so the preferential degradation of BID2, uh, and also an early uh, sort of suppression sign of MIC and HMOX1, suggesting early apoptosis from these cells, even in, this, in these uh, conditions. And so, uh, you know, what is the uh, functional uh, consequence now of this? And can we show really the outperformance at functional level of our trivalent molecule uh, compared to parent bivalent molecules? And so we were able to show this in, in different settings. Uh, shown here is in this uh, hybrid uh, CRISPR CMIC lines uh, in the NETS lab, where you could see much more profound uh, depletion, time dependent suppression of MIC level and um, uh, sort of co consequent uh, uh, cell viability, uh, cytotoxicity uh, from CIM1, but not the parent bivalent inhibitor and uh, the parent inactive uh, um, VHL uh, uh, epimer, uh, but also in more functional uh, assays such as apoptosis and PARP cleavage assays, uh, uh, caspase assays, and these colony formation assays and not just in AML, but in this case here, also this prostate, a bad sensitive cancer line, uh, we saw consistent, uh, consistently the trivalent product outperforming uh, in all of these assays, the, uh, the parent bivalent inhibitors or degraders um, as shown. Uh, and so uh, we now have a trivalent molecule that is super potent and super fast. And, uh, and so we really wanted to go down back to the drawing board and ask the question, what makes it such a potent molecule? And, uh, uh, and so we uh, leverage uh, thoughts from uh, an understanding from the bivalent parent inhibitors, which are known, uh, have been shown to dimer, you know, to intramolecularly engage uh, the two bromo domain within this uh, given bet protein. And so uh, the next question for us really mechanistically were, does the trivalent uh, protac display a similar type of intramolecular cis engagement? And can it form you know, one to one to one then complexes with, with the ligase? And to what extent uh, does the molecular recognition underpin uh, its uh, uh, remarkably boosted mechanism of action? And so we reverted to biophysics and a number of techniques were employed. So uh, the first uh, one that Satomi uh, performed in the lab was size exclusion chromatography, uh, because we can now run these complexes in, in the gel filtration column. And depending on their size, we can see them running at different elution volumes. And so uh, we express and purify these tandem constructs of bad proteins, where we have now the BD1 and BD2 present in both in the same protein. And indeed, uh, when we have SIM1, we were able to demonstrate consistent with the bivalent inhibitor MT1, uh, a conformational uh, sort of engagement in a cis intramolecular fashion. You can see due to that, that the, the complex runs at a, at a higher elution volume compared to what we saw for uh, uh, unbound or uh, uh, tandem construct or tandem construct engaged by uh, monovalently. Uh, uh, interestingly, if we can, if we block one of the two domains um, with a mutation, uh, they now abrogate binding of the, of the head to the domain, uh, then we, uh, we could demonstrate formation of two to one complexes, uh, both with CIM1 and with the bivalent inhibitor as a control. Um, but not when uh, we now have uh, the, uh, the overall complex with the wild type. You can see here, that in the presence of VHL, we can now form the one-to-one -one, uh, complex as shown uh, here by uh, the red trace, um, but not with the inactive CIM1, which is unable to engage uh, VCB. And so they're all, uh, this result demonstrated uh, the ability of, uh, of a trivalent molecule to simultaneously engage in cis, uh, the tandem protein. Uh, and to form one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one stoichiometry of ternary complexes. Uh, and this conformational change was also confirmed by the NET in, in nanobred conformational sensor data. 
Uh, we then wanted to characterize further thermodynamics and kinetics of formation of these complexes to try and get a, a better understanding uh, what did this all meant and how could it underpin the mode of action. So first we uh, uh, wanted to get some measurements on, on affinities. So we perform ITC titrations in a reverse fashion. So titrating protein, in this case, tandem construct into uh, a cell containing uh, the preformed binary complex between DHL and the trivalent molecules. And so first, when we have uh, those tandem constructs that have a single point mutations as expected from the size exclusion chromatography, we see uh, two to one stoichiometry. That allows as well actually to quantify, you can see here the affinity for the individual uh, domain engagement. And you can see uh, here that the engagement at the BD1 uh, is weaker than the engagement of the BD2 by about tenfold, consistent with the MZ1 uh, findings of preferential engagement of BD2. Uh, in contrast, when we now have the uh, wild type tandem titrated into the system, uh, we saw a remarkable shift to one to one stoichiometry, again, consistent with the cis engagement and uh, an exquisitely avid system. Uh, very high affinity. Uh, uh, we've got here uh, uh, affinities that you know we can't quantify uh, too potent in this experiment below 20 nanomolar. And you can see here the delta H um, uh, being essentially very close to being the sum of, uh, of the two domains. Um, and, and this was very nicely mirrored by tenery complex uh, nanobread assays in the NETS lab exactly under the same condition. You can see much more profound, faster and more profound signal uh, for the one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one wild type complex compared to the mutant complexes. Uh, and so, uh, but what about now forming the whole complex? We wanted to get it more into measuring cooperativity. So not only we have avidity of engagement, but also we saw cooperativity in the formation of these one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one complexes, a factor of five at VHL uh, from this data from Scott Hughes in the lab, uh, monitoring binding of VHL in the absence of presence of the tandem construct. Uh, we saw also cooperativity at the, at the bromo domain level. And the result of all of this is we can form very stable complexes uh, as we were able to demonstrate again by SPR, uh, uh, very slow dissociation in the chip and notably uh, in this uh, um, competitive uh, nanobread uh, target engagement assays uh, from Kristin and Danette, uh, where they're using a uh, tracer, uh, which um, uh, can uh, been added to uh, displace the pre-incubated uh, complex in life cells, uh, pre-incubated with a bunch of different compounds uh, in different conditions. And you can see here the remarkable uh, uh, differentiation that we are seeing going from uh, monovalent engagement to bivalent cooperative engagement of MZ1 protac to bivalent engagement at the target end with MT1 and CIS-SIM1 and ultimately added on top of that uh, this trivalent and cooperative recruitment of VHL in the one-to-one -one complex uh, by SIM1 and really demonstrating that the ability to additionally engage VHL um, uh, allows for this such a prolonged residence time uh, on top of the AVID uh, interaction, uh, really underpinning the remarkable potency of this trivalent uh, product. And so sort of putting it all together, you know, how SIM1 now works and what are the advantages of, of trivalent mode of action. Uh, so our data uh, um, all together allows us to put together a model of how this works. And so, you know, we have preferential BD2 uh, recruitment uh, of SIM1, um, uh, after which we see cis intramolecular engagement following conformational change. And so we have avidity and cooperativity over, uh, after all in this one-on-one to one complex. Uh, and of course here, I'm showing it to you for convenience, binding of the HL first and then engaging of the uh, uh, tandem bromo domain, but obviously the, the other way around can also be true. And so the, the consequence of this is profound. And so if you think about what it all means about tertiary complex formation now, um, then you have you know, a monovalent degraders that will uh, exhibit the conventional um, sigmoidal type of curve in a log-based fashion uh, for recruitment of the ternary complex. 
you know, the bivalent uh, um, uh, uh, have advantages, but obviously can, can uh, are subjected to the hook effect, which is a very high concentration. We're gonna be saturating the binaries and, and competing the ternaries. And so uh, if we can be cooperative with the bivalent, then uh, we're gonna improve that. But ultimately in a trivalent fashion, we can be not only cooperative, but also we can have avidity. And that ultimately can really boost uh, uh, the whole equilibria and, uh, and not just that, but it will, it will also increase the residence time and potentially lead to, you know, um, uh, also stabilization and bias at a confirmational level, which uh, warrants certainly uh, future investigation. Uh, but just a summary uh, of this part of the talk, I, uh, I've showed you how using structure-based design um, of tenery complex crystal structures of parent bivalent products and bivalent inhibitors, um, we've been able to design and synthesize trivalent products, uh, showing proof of concept for the first time of augmenting valency of this type of molecules, uh, leading to a molecule that outperforms uh, its parent bivalent molecules in all sorts of assays that we were, we, we've been working on, uh, where we have avidity of binding, but we also have cooperativity, where we form stable long-lived complexes. And these features go all hand in hand uh, you know, to enhance uh, the target degradation uh, process. Uh, but you know, thinking beyond all of this, and thinking about all this sort of new exciting therapeutic modalities and, uh, and, and, and new proximity-based modalities that the field is, is now uh, um, uh, sort of uh, getting uh, off um, uh, and emerging, that this potentially has, uh, has, you know, is showing proof of concept for increasing valency as a strategy to, uh, to recruit different proteins together and to boost any of this type of proximity-induced modalities. And so with that, I would just like to uh, uh, really acknowledge a fantastic team uh, of scientists uh, and researchers in the what we call the, the trivalent team, fantastic collaboration with Donna Daniel's lab, as mentioned. Uh, Satomi really drove the chemistry in my lab, uh, Kristen really drove the, uh, a lot of the biochemistry assays in the NET lab. And uh, uh, yeah, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you again for this uh, wonderful invitation and uh, uh, be uh, look forward to taking any and, and answering any questions. Thank you.